Well, welcome. I'm so glad you're here with us. Um, my name is Eric. My wife, Deborah, is coming on over here in a minute. And we just wanted to welcome you. If you heard about this from a friend, if you heard about this from your spouse, uh, if you uh, heard about this from Gateway, many of us are part of a church in Austin called Gateway. We're so glad that you're here. Um, we're going to be talking about some ways to improve marriage or be ready for marriage, depending on where you're at in the journey. And as you can uh, imagine, during the season of quarantine, some couples have found this to be uh, a, a reinvigorating time in the relationship, more time together. Uh, others have found it really difficult. Um, give me a it seems inappropriate to say for a thumbs up for what I'm about to ask, but do any of you know a couple that have uh, separated or filed for divorce during coronavirus? Just give me a thumbs up with the little reactions. Yeah. Like I said, if there was a thumbs down, I would, I would ask you to do that. We do too, unfortunately. Uh, for some couples, it could be this was just, you know, the breaking point of what they would say was a long period of difficulties. But my hope would be that uh, tonight, if you're in a bad place in your marriage, you might uh, give, it, give yourselves another chance not to give up. Uh, because what we hope to do is share with you some principles that will help you grow closer to each other, to actually have the kind of marriage you've always wanted to have. Uh, and so we're going to kick it off. Uh, Jesse and Chrissy, uh, they have uh, a lot. Of children they'll tell you all about and so uh, if you will you have a little reaction down there give a little uh, hand clap for Jesse and Chrissy as they kick us off 72 participants wow oh yeah 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 so I didn't know you were gonna record this <laughs> I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to dial this down a bit I won't have to, just kidding so hey guys if we haven't met my name is Jesse uh, serve here at the, at the Buda campus. Uh, this is my wife, Chrissy. Hi. And so uh, what I thought is um, the best thing to do is let you hear from Chrissy first. And so I'm just going to let her kind of give her side of it, and then I'll, and I'll come in. We're going to be talking about pursuing each other, and what does that mean, and what does that look like uh, as uh, married couples. So. All right. Okay. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, turn your phones off. Stop the scrolling. Turn the TVs off. Eliminate all these distractions that y'all have behind the screen. This is about to get real, y'all. Take some notes. It's going to be fun. Okay? All right. Let's see. So pursue. To chase, pursue, to follow, to trail. Um, meaning to go after or track something down or someone down. Are you doing that with your spouse? Or you pursue suggests a continuing effort to overtake and reach and attain. What type of marriage are we doing that with or for? Um, so pursue, what I love about pursue is that it's an action verb. Um, it calls for us to be intentional, seeking, and active. In marriage, it's an ongoing journey. And we will pursue one another until we die. Right? Yeah. That's right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, I kind of looked up the meaning of pursue. So pursue of a person is to continue or proceed along a path or a route. Um, engaging in an activity or course of action. Um, continue to investigate, explore, and discover. And I just love all of that because it's, it means that we are continuously growing in knowing each other. So are we pursuing our spouse like we pursue our careers or our children or um, others' approval or acknowledgement or accomplishment or insert whatever you're pursuing right now? Are we pursuing Jesus um, as our husband or as our spouse? Um, I know there are some unbelievers, um, some people that are still seeking and wanting to know who God is, and um, that's great. And this, um, as a believer, uh, knowing that God um, is my first love, 
um, that made a big difference when I came to faith and uh, was able to acknowledge my relationship with Jesus. Um, let's see. So as you grow closer to God, your relationship with your spouse will grow too and grow deeper. For those of us that are believers, sometimes we place our spouse in the position of God. Um, so there's a saying that says, or the thing that we go by, you want to say that part, okay. this part? Oh, yeah. So I think there's, there's just a, um, there's an order and it can be different. And so I would just say, if you're on the call right now and you're like, Hey, I'm just, I'm just checking faith out. Like I, um, we're not really there yet. Uh, I get it. And I, and I'm with you. Uh, I'll share my story here in a little bit. Um, I'm only 10 years into this thing. And so, uh, I see you and, and acknowledge that what I would say for, some couples that we walk through and even for our marriage, uh, a list of priorities and where do we place things? Uh, most people place at the top, uh, their spouse, uh, they'll place their kids underneath that, maybe career. Um, for us, uh, and for those that do follow Jesus, I think the order that your, your marriage should follow should be, God should be first, then your marriage, then anything after that. If you have kids, that should be definitely third. But then career, and, and you can go on for list from there, but to pursue after God first in your marriage and knowing that um, I can't make my wife happy and she can't make me happy. We have to, to seek out. So that's kind of the principle we live by. Mm -hmm. And we haven't always lived by that principle in our marriage. So we've been together um, a little over 16 years, and that was not – we've done a lot of growing, y'all, a lot. Um, so – my question to you, and these are things you can just chew on, um, who is your spouse? Who are they today? Who were they when you met them? Do you truly know them? Are you learning new things about one another? Are you learning new things together? Um, we grow over time, and that means that we, our thoughts um, and what we like, our dreams, mature with us. So do you know how your spouse feels loved? Are you showing them how they feel loved? Does your spouse know how you feel loved? And are you dating or have you stopped dating? Yeah. All you. It's good. Good. We're dating. Yeah. These two. These two. Yeah, so um, I'll start off by saying this. Um, I've heard it said, I think it was Jim Rowan. I don't look it up, it's not that important. But what I will say is this. Uh, what I heard, I believe what I heard said was, um, why do we study all these experts who may or may not have been through the thing that we're going through? Give me instead someone who has screwed up royally, someone who has absolutely failed miserably, and I want to study that person so I know what not to do. And that's where I'm going to start tonight. And so uh, if you have kids around, this is definitely PG-21. Just kidding. Uh, so you don't need any parental guidance. But I will, um, I will say some things. I'm going to be vulnerable on this. Um, and so uh, I'm going to start out, before I do that, I'm going to start out by reading 1 Corinthians uh, 7, uh, verses 2 through 6. If you don't have your Bible, you can just listen and uh, kind of let this be the framework of where I go after this. But it says, it says here, Paul writes, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise, the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but yields it to her husband. And in the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except perhaps by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves oh. to prayer. <clears throat> and I love that. Now, if you would have read that to me 11 years ago, I would have been like, yeah, see, somebody read this to me. We're supposed, like, you're supposed to devote yourself to me, like give it to me, right? That's how I would have died. That's my framework, right? Because I, had a, I came from a place of sexual brokenness before my marriage. And I brought that into my marriage. Now, Paul's not wrong what he writes about. But what he's talking about is a mutual submission to one another. Loving and honoring and respecting each other. And that's not how I viewed sex uh, before we were married. And definitely six years into our marriage, 
that's still, I still viewed it that way. Um, now, when I came to Jesus, it took a little bit of time to unravel that. Um, and that's because, mainly because of pornography. I had an addiction to pornography. And I ended up viewing my wife as an object, uh, and it almost destroyed our marriage. Uh, actually, she, she found out that I was looking at pornography on my phone, and uh, she confronted me with it. And I can tell you right in that moment, I felt shame, I felt guilt, uh, and it took a lot of time for me to understand that what that was doing to my marriage is it was destroying my marriage. And I just couldn't see it. I didn't look at my wife like an object, like a gift. I looked at her like an object. And I was objectifying her, even in the context of our marriage. And so what I can say to you is this, you know, I came to faith 10 years ago, and uh, I'm still growing. And what I can tell you today is I, I don't look at pornography. Um, we put those balances in checks. But, you know, always the temptation is there. But I honor my wife today and not letting that creep back in. I don't come from a place of judgment, but for either spouses on this call, is there something that's keeping you from seeing your spouse as a gift? And what I want to say is if so, seek help. Marriage counseling is not a bad word. Uh, you can reach out to one of the pastors on this call, Eric, me, Johnny, or, or Norman. Uh, but the, the, the key is, is to not let that continue. Whatever that pattern is, that's not letting you see your spouse as a gift to pursue instead of an object. And so um, what I'd also is make the point, if you, if you don't date right now, I, now I'm assuming a lot of you dated before you got married. Uh, and we like that idea, like we chase after the, the spouse, like I'm dating for a goal. Yeah. Like honestly, um, I'll say this. I think I'd be transparent. I'm, Eric's my boss. We'll find out tomorrow if I'm still here. But I, I honestly, early on, because of my sexual brokenness, I chased after my wife to get in the pants. Like, I chased after my wife to be with her sexually. That's why initially I chased after my wife. And it took time for me to understand, okay, well, that's not really dating. And I drug that into our marriage. And we didn't date in our marriage for a very long time. And it wasn't until a few years ago that we enacted date night regularly and so we date every week on friday it's just me and her our 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 kids which yeah we have we have we nine have kids total kids, uh eight one seventeen we have seven at the house and so uh they kind of they kind of babysit themselves but they they you know we have a date night where it is regular no excuses no excuses and what we've learned what, I, what i've learned on those date nights is i've learned to appreciate my wife because I asked questions and learned more about her. And I'll give you one example. I can't go through all of them, but what I'll give you one example is, um, my, I think my wife has always loved birds. I can't stand birds. Like I, I actually run from birds. I don't, they're weird. They come from top, bald. That's the Eric <laughs> knows this is like a landing pad right here. So birds always been like a little thing for me. But she, I think, has always loved birds, but it's through dating that understanding and watching her that I found that she truly does love birds. And what I know now is I can love that quirkiness about her. And each time I look at her, usually we're driving, I look over at her and I'm like, I love this woman more and more, even though she loves birds. And, and it's actually because of that, I love her more, because it's kind of quirky. And it's a thing I, that is, is unique to her. Even bought her a bird feeder. She goes out and watches the birds. And so see, pursuing can be something as simple as that, learning what, your, your spouse is passionate about? What are their goals? What do they love? What do you not know about them that they maybe have not shared with you? Maybe it's a passion from their childhood, but you won't uncover that going through the daily rhythm of your lives. You got to stop and intentionally date. And guys, listen to this. If you hear nothing else on this whole thing, you are, you're going to, you're going to remember things, but if you hear nothing else, hear this, there is hope for your marriage, no matter where it's at. There is hope for your marriage. And that's what I'd say. Thank you guys so much. A uh, little hand clap for Jesse and Chrissy. Uh, really grateful. Uh, yes, they still date with eight children. Eight children. Obviously, they, we asked them to talk about pursuing each other because they have done that. Uh, but I really appreciate just sharing so openly about your own journeys. Uh, thank you very much for sharing about that. We're going to, uh, 
I, we're going to send you a follow-up email. Uh, Gateway and Pflugerville has a, a marriage class that you can take. We also have something called Soulmates for those of you who are not yet married. That'll be hosted online by uh, Gateway North. And all of our Austin area campuses, and those of you from outside of Austin, are also welcome to jump into any of our community groups, life groups, uh, many of which are couples groups. And so having couple friends, we'll talk about more in a minute, can be very helpful. All right, so I'm gonna, I, I like that Ben and Tara said, they put the eight in date. Well played, well played. All right, uh, next, uh, Norman and Tracy Garcia are gonna share about resolving conflict. You might not have noticed in the chat, I'm putting little notes there of what we're hearing. But step one to maximize your marriage, pursue your spouse. Step two, learn how to resolve conflict. Norman and Tracy, they both live out in Dripping Springs. Give us a little of your context and uh, share with us. Yes, hello everybody. I'm still, I still need to finish taking my notes from uh, Jesse and Chrissy. <laughs> I love birds. <laughs> <laughs> I like birds, Chrissy. You're not quirky. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to be talking about overcoming conflict. And really the, the biggest idea in this is, um, is never let the sun go down while you are angry. So let me repeat that. Never let the sun go down while you are angry. So this is wisdom from the Bible. It's not something we made up, of course, um, but it is, it is an incredible wisdom. And I have to be honest with you, I have not been the best at this in our 25 years of marriage. And so this is something that I have uh, worked on in the recent years um, as Tracy and I have come through some, you know, of course we've been through ups and downs. Um, and, um, and so I've learned to work on this and, um, and you'll see a little bit, uh, a little bit more of why uh, I was not good at it for several years. So, so what does it mean to to never let the sun go down while you're angry? So this means working through conflict every day. So, when when we don't work through conflict every day, bitterness can creep in, and when bitterness creeps in, then distance between us becomes a certainty. So in the midst of distance, then it comes a temptation. And it can be temptation to think and feel the worst about your spouse. It can be a temptation to, to believe and act as if your, your spouse is your enemy. It can be temptation to, to look outside your spouse, to, to, to find comfort and relief, like bad habits, addictions, or, or even a, another a relationship that's unhealthy. So learning to forgive, it, it's a must in marriage. And unforgiveness in our hearts creates doubts in our minds. I'll say that again. Unforgiveness in our hearts creates doubt in our minds. And it causes us to look back at our relationship and to see only the negative. So we become blind to the good stuff that, that, that is, that, that's in our relationship. And we only see the patterns that, that make it appear to us that things are only bad and, and they're never going to get better. So, but in reality, it's because of the, the unresolved conflict uh, that's gone on for weeks or months or even years. So we have to figure out how to find forgiveness in our relationship before it becomes a problem or before it starts to uh, create separation and bitterness. Um, so that's why we say, don't let the sun go down while you're angry. So we're going to do a little test, um, that tells how you handle conflict because conflict is inevitable in relationships. You're going to have conflict. And so how you deal with it and knowing that about yourself can help you as a couple, but it's one way is not bad and one way is not good. It's just different. So imagine that you're in a fight. Okay, and you're really, really mad at each other. Now, think about yourself, not your spouse, but do a little test. We won't raise hands, but just think to yourself, are you the one that is doing the pursuing? Like, let's talk about this, let's talk about this, let's talk about this, come on, come on, come on. Or are you the one 
that is wanting to go behind the door, close the door, and you're like, oh my gosh, back off, you're coming on too strong, I need space, I need time. So the first one we call the run, the chaser, and the second one we call the runner. I'm the runner in the relationship. I'm the chaser. <laughs> He's a chaser. So, but what's neat though is that one's not better than the other. Both want to resolve conflict, and so I think understanding each other helps they, they can both be weaknesses and strengths. So a chaser is motivated to deal with the problem to get it resolved. It's out of, I'm chasing because I want to resolve this. I want to, uh, there to be peace. The runner is saying, well, I want there to be peace and for there to be peace, I need time. I need to calm down and I need to think clearly so that I'm not talking and, you know, in the middle of being angry. So, go ahead. So, okay. So again, so you say that I'm ready. You're ready to to make sure that the sun the sun doesn't go down while while you're angry. So now what? So here's some 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 bullet points or some tips that Tracy and I have have, have of things that we've used in in our 25 years of marriage, uh, and even more so recently in the past six or seven years um, that have helped us. So I would say the the first one uh, is remember that your spouse is not your enemy so don't treat them like the enemy so we can easily fall into this into this trap of feeling and acting like our spouse is our enemy and and, and, and we're, we're triggered we're seeing red and we forget that this is the person i love the most in the world isn't it, isn't it amazing how quickly we can forget that uh, and so regard regardless of how you feel choose to believe the best about each other um, and then another point is, so you, you need to ask yourself when you're, when you're beginning to deal with a conflict, are you, are you triggered? Are you in the, the, the state of mind that you need to be to work through the problem? And if not, then ask for a timeout. So, so who knew that adults can also, uh, uh, you know, go to timeout, but, but, um, what you definitely want to work out the, the problem as soon as possible. Uh, sooner the better, same day if you can, absolutely. But when we say uh, don't let the sun go down uh, uh, on your anger, it doesn't mean that you have to have all your problems worked out uh, completely that same night. It's actually more like you coming to your spouse and saying, you matter to me, I, I want peace. Let's pick a time uh, to tomorrow or, or soon to work through this. So, 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 so you're giving each other time to cool down and to remember that you actually like each other and you want to work through these, these issues. Another, another uh, uh, thought that, that we just really try to keep in mind is it's something really that, that, that Jesus taught. Um, you know, even if you're, you're not yet sure about what you're, where you stand in terms of your faith towards Jesus, um, you know, most people consider him a wise, a wise person. And, um, and so this is some wisdom that he gave. When he asked us to, he said that he was teaching us how to pray, right? And he said in that, in this, this prayer that he taught us how to pray, one of the things he said is he, he was telling us to pray, forgive me for my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. So he's saying that no one is getting out of this with a perfect record, right? We're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to hurt someone, and we're all going to be hurt by someone because none of us is perfect. And he knew that we, we would make those mistakes, and he knew that we would hurt others, and we would need forgiveness for that. He knew that others would hurt us, and we would need to forgive them for that. And so he's telling us to ask for forgiveness and he's, and he's also saying to ask, uh, to, to, to ask him for help to forgive the person who hurts us. You know, they say that, uh, uh, for, uh, I think it goes, forgiveness is divine. It's really, forgiveness is something, and I've, I've experienced in my life, is something that I, I look to God for strength to do. And so that, that's huge. None of us is perfect. Even Jesus knew 2,000 years ago when he said this, that we're all gonna make mistakes and people are gonna hurt us and we're gonna hurt people and we're gonna need to practice forgiveness. So the next point is, um, you know, ask God for help and then choose to forgive your spouse even before they ask. 
So this is something that I've more recently been practicing in the past couple of years. So I used to wait to forgive Tracy uh, when, when I thought that, um, you know, when, when she would, until she would ask me to forgive her. And when I thought that maybe her, her, uh, her request for forgiveness was really sincere, or if she, uh, you know, apologized and asked for forgiveness for the right things, and then I would, you know, bestow her with my forgiveness. And, um, and, then, and then I realized um, that I could forgive or at least start forgiveness, the forgiveness process even before she apologizes. And so this thought came to me that, that God knew that I was going to need forgiveness and, and, and even 2,000 years ago. And, and, and so Jesus did the work 2,000 years ago through his death and his, uh, on the cross and his burial and his resurrection so that I could be forgiven today and in the future for, for the things that I've done wrong. Um, and if so, if God can act in the past to forgive me today and in the future for whatever I may do wrong, I can have it already decided in my heart to forgive uh, Emma Tracy for any way she may hurt me. So that in the moment when she asks me for forgiveness, regardless of how I might feel, my answer is yes, because it's already decided. God forgave me and he teaches me uh, and sets a model for me uh, in terms of forgiving Tracy. So when she asks yes, regardless of how I feel, I can say, yes, I forgive you when she asked me to forgive her. And it's amazing because just saying those words, even if you're angry and you don't feel it, yes, I forgive you. It, in me, I can certainly speak for, it causes this release. And it's, I get released from the anger. All of a sudden, this, uh, the, the anger and the hurt and this hold that unforgiveness has on me, it, it starts to just be released. And it allows for the healing to, to start happening in my heart. And so uh, another point is to, to keep your problem solving meetings, because we're all gonna have them, like Tracy said, we're all gonna have conflict. Um, keep your problem solving, solving meetings separate from your dates. So you want to reserve your dates for, you want that to be good, positive time and, and, and ex, a great experience where you guys are really enjoying that and save the problem solving for later. It doesn't matter how, what the problems are, just save it for later. And then, for instance, you know, Tracy's parents, um, my, uh, my in-laws, they'll, they, they're in their 70s and they, they'll set an appointment, they call it couch time. And so they'll say, okay, we need to have some couch time. They'll set an appointment for it. And they'll go sit on the couch and they'll work through their problems. Um, and they'll have that special time set aside and work through their issues, even at their, you know, at their age. And so, and we tend to do ours. Uh, we sit either on the back porch um, uh, or, or go to the bedroom, just away from the kids. And, and you know, we really, you really don't want to try to resolve conflict in front of the kids. It's not good for them, and they will give you their opinion. And, <laughs> and my least favorite opinion is, "Mom's right, Dad." <laughs> so just yeah, it's better not to to argue or resolve the conflict in front of them. And so the um, the next point that I'd make is, it's okay to get help if you're stuck and you can't find your way forward. You know, Tracy and I seven years ago we got stuck. And it was because of our, us knowing that we could go to Eric and we could go to Kenny, Kenny Green. Many of you guys know Kenny Green. And they helped us and they helped us when we couldn't see our own way, they helped us see the path in front of us and, and just really took us by the hand and take, to take those first few steps to work, work through that issue that we were going through. So talk to a pastor or a counselor or a person who has a, a seasoned, successful marriage. And, and there's nothing wrong with finding help to get unstuck and to, and to keep the communication flowing. My turn, okay. Um, yeah, can you minimize that? Like, yeah, go down. Like, no, so I can, don't, so I'm not looking at that. Oh, you don't want to see it? No. Okay. Sorry. 
Go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. No, I, I do want to add that it's, we dated, we dated for three years and we've been married for 25. So we've been together 28 years. We met when I was five. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, it made me so mad. One time we went out to dinner and we were getting, Norman tried to order a near beer. With, and, I mean, we were in our early 20s, parted him and not me because he's five years older. The waitress was like, I'm so sorry, I can't give you a near beer, you don't look 18. But you can get it. I was so mad. He had this baby face. But ours, I will say, was an epic love story. I mean, just for me, epic. Like, we knew we loved each other more than anybody on earth has ever loved each other and ever will love each other. And it was so wonderful and amazing. And then 10 years later, we had kids. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and then the arguments started, but we were still madly in love. And for us, our conflict really started when he had to travel for work. And then we found out it's really hard to have a good marriage when you don't live together. And he traveled for four days a week, and I had a big job and two kids in school and sports. And we just thought our love would coast through because we loved each other so, so much. It was going to be a happily ever after, right? Wrong conflict arose and it escalated quickly because we went three years thinking we could just figure this out and he was gone all the time and resentment built me because I'm doing kids and he's doing trying to build this business and bam and so we did we did one of the steps we talked about and we sought help and that made all the difference so but I will say one of the huge things that I would definitely definitely add I have been reading, I can't take the credit for this advice, but I've been reading some, a book about it and listening to a podcast. And one of the biggest things that I will say that's made the difference, uh, I mean, because we have three kids. We don't have as many as Jesse and Chrissy. They win that, <laughs> but I wish. <laughs> but we have three and that's enough. We have, you know, almost 16, almost 13 and four. So it, it gets pretty wild in our house, but, and, and that's a source of conflict, you know, when your kids are doing this and going this way and how do you do with this kid and that kid. And, but I'll say one of the biggest things I'm learning is you're supposed to be honest, right? You're supposed to be honest spouse. And I always hear that. And, but that doesn't mean we're their critic. And what I'm learning is pretty much the only time I really need to offer my constructive criticism is when I have prayed about it and God presents an opportunity or it presents itself and it just feels right and Norman feels receptive and it's a peaceful, positive thing. Other than that, I need to like kindergarten it, zip it, lock it, throw it in my pocket and keep it to myself because you know God didn't appoint me as his personal critic. And that, you know, has been a huge thing in, I don't know, the past year that God has just really shown me. And it was funny because um, Norma looked at me one day and he goes, I don't know what you're doing, but thank you. Keep it up. And I giggled. I was like, I have a secret book and you can't read my secret book. It's telling me all these cool things to do. And I like forbid him from touching my secret book of how to be a better wife. It's basically just shut up. <laughs> but no there to it but it's really helped me see because you know like Nora was saying I mean what brought you together you love this person you think they're amazing but then you move in you get married life happens you have kids and suddenly they're driving you nuts so maybe not all the time but sometimes and we don't necessarily need to share that we can just you know and remember what we love about that person and Anyhow, so that's in my two cents. So it's not, I see it as happily ever after. I see it as happily sought after. You have to work at it. Great. So, hey, thank and you, you guys have so a lot much. Are you allowed to tell us the name of that secret book? <laughs> I don't know. Husbands can't look it up. Wives will have a secret call after. No, <laughs> no it's called The Empowered Wife. But it, it's, a it's a little bit controversial. Like me and my best friend were debating it. So it's kind of a take it or leave it kind of book. But um, I've been able to take some good stuff from it. That's great. It's, her name is Laura Doyle. So. All right. Thank you so much. Hey, let's uh, hand clap Norman and Tracy. And uh, thank you guys so much. And then uh, I'd like to ask John and Gloria out in Pflugerville to share with us step three 
uh, improving communication. All right. Well, uh, it's great to be with you guys. I feel like we're the young bucks. Because we've only been married, I guess. We're, we're getting ready for 10 years. Um, but, I mean, it's been a journey already. And I know we're kind of like at halftime right now. So do a quick stretch break if you need. I know it's Tuesday, but it's Tuesday. All right. So, um, and as you're doing that, I wanted to ask you guys just to consider your last serious miscommunication with your significant other. You can just think about it in your mind. If it's helpful, you can jot it down on your uh, notes or on your phone. But what happened and why? And then what do you wish was different about the situation, about yourself, how you showed up, or maybe about the other person? So I'll just give you a, a minute or two. We're not gonna take too much time here. So consider your first, or, or rather your last serious miscommunication. What happened and why? What do you wish was different? Either about yourself, the situation, or the other person? And now you hear our little one calling for us. Or for her, actually. <laughs> Don't worry, we're not delinquent parents. We got grandparents right now helping out. I promise our little one is being cared for. Okay, well, um, I, I want to encourage you guys after tonight just to have an opportunity to dialogue about what you just wrote or what you just thought about. but. I'm going to dive in real quick. So Gloria and I share some similarities, but at our core, we're super different people. I mean, we love the differences about each other when we first began dating, uh, but then engagement came, marriage, and we learned that our differences actually made communication just difficult, right? It was just hard to understand each other. And, you know, it was one of those learning curves that we just didn't feel like we ever turned right for for a very long time and so uh, i mean what are some of the differences that we have um well i'm a high feeler and john's a high thinker for one so i often talk through my feelings and john <laughs> often doesn't go through his head <laughs> <laughs> and then i think another one of the differences that we uh ran into this is just like being at home with each other right like I like to say that Gloria is super clean. Very organized, not clean. And she's just like, really? I'm not that clean. You're just dirty. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, we've had actually argument after argument about just the cleanliness sometimes. I'm like, can I just be dirty in this one section? This is my John section to be dirty and disorganized. And then I felt like, my dirty section just kept on shrinking over time. Because <laughs> I still have to see it. So it's not your section anymore. And I mean, we went back and forth on this, but um, I think around communication, we just began to learn a couple of different things. And just full disclosure, anything that's relational that I am sharing is probably from her because she's the relational guru. Uh, she, she also counts for my so. That's part of it. Um, but yeah, would you share a couple of things that have been helpful? So similar to kind of what, you know, we've been hearing from the other couples. Um, we, so we came up with a few points and the, so the first one is just kind of having grace for one another. Um, so kind of like choosing our battles. I think um, the more you get to learn from, about your significant other, the more you're like, oh my God, there's like so many things going on. What's happening? here and so kind of knowing like okay are these the things that are going to be important to me in a year and so a lot of times when we kind of do therapy we, we have or we encourage our clients to think about like okay like will this really matter in one year like if it will matter in a year then yeah we need to bring it up but if at the end of the day it's not that big of a deal to be able to let that go um and to be able to just say like you know that's not that important there's bigger fish to fry in the world and just giving grace to one another um, is super important. Um, and then the next one that we talk about is kind of 
um, choosing a time to have conversations. So I think everyone's emphasizing like having a date or kind of just making sure that um, you know, we're set up well. And so if you know that your counterpart is like super busy, it's probably not the best time to talk to them about what is going on because they're not really listening. Um, and so- Or at of, the beginning of the day when they don't have coffee yet. Yes, or at the beginning of the day or at the end of the day when people are tired. Like those are probably not the most opportune times to have like deep conversations. And so one another and just being like, hey, um, I wanna talk about this soon. Like when is a good time? And so kind of checking in with your spouse or your significant other to um, really see like, you know, is there a good time for us to check in and talk? And so it sets up the other person to know that there's a conversation coming so they don't feel bombarded and bamboozled. I like to say, don't bamboozle your spouse. Um, but for them to feel prepared and for them to know that something is happening and something is coming and so they can feel emotionally ready to have that conversation. And that's super important. And if you get scared, that's on you. <laughs> um, I'm going to share just two other things that have been helpful for us. One is this idea of creating space. And it's actually, uh, you know, pegged onto an idea that I discovered a while back um, around this concept. It's from kind of Jewish ancient mysticism. It's called Zimzum, right? And so Zimzum is this concept of just creating space for one another it originates from this idea that God himself created space for you and me. Uh, in the act of creation, God kind of pulled back in some ways so that we could have space to exist, to be, and to live in freedom. And I mean, you, you trace it back to even Jesus, uh, his love for us and how he really creates space for us because of his forgiveness, his heart towards us no matter what we've done or, or not done. Um, and so my question really is, do you create space for one another, right? And practically where that leads is in, in the stream of communication, do you actually make intentional efforts to reflect what the person just said? Uh, I'll give you an example, right? So if Gloria is saying, well, I feel like you not really care about this place being clean, and that, that just triggers me, right? Well, I think if I'm in the defensive position, then I would say, well, what about this? I, I cleaned the dishes, I did this and that, and I start naming all the different ways that I have shown up, right? But I'm not literally creating any space for her. I'm just defending myself. And I'm trying to withhold um, or, or, or take a hold of whatever space I feel like is mine. You guys tracking with that? Um, so what, what might be helpful instead is just to say, you know, I, I, I'm going to reflect what you just said to me. So Gloria, I'm hearing from you that uh, when I'm not picking up my mess with all my clothes, that makes you feel a little bit at, uh, uneasy or maybe, you know, like you just feel like I'm not caring for you, right? And then I ask her, is that how you feel? And so I'm trying, to, I'm trying to take in what she's saying, I'm creating space, reflecting back to her, and I'm making sure that she feels heard and acknowledged rather than me defending myself, right? And if you guys do that back and forth with, with each other, then what inevitably happens is you feel loved, you feel seen. And isn't that what we all want, right? When it comes to our places of miscommunication, we're trying to vie for this sense of attention or understanding and all we need to do with one another is just to create space uh, to reflect um, what the other person might be saying. And so, wait, I just want to put in that nonviolent communication is a, is a really amazing technique. It talks about like, you know, expressing what it is that you need. And then like, when you meet that need, this is how I feel. Or when you don't meet this need, this is how I feel. And so being able to talk about that with one another. And so like, I have a need for, um, feeling respected and when you don't do these things, it makes me feel sad, right? And so being able to have that person express that need and how that makes them feel is really helpful because then your counterpart is able to hear that. So nonviolent communication is a really amazing way that we use that with a lot of our couples as well. So yeah. I saw that, so Thanks. kudos to Miriam. Yeah, thank you for that. <laughs> oh, your counterpart. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, um, the last thing that I wanted to share is just um, understanding our context, right? Like we are 
all couched in family systems that we grew up in, um, cultural history, and also understandings that we took on from our parents, good and bad and everything in between. Um, part of what that means is just being able to trace back, like, why do I think the way that I think? Why do I have these expectations? Why do I even frame certain things the way that I frame them? For example, um, sometimes I will say to Gloria, hey, can I help with doing some of the laundry? Now, why do I say it that way? Why do I say, can I help you with the laundry? Well, it's because I've, I've seen in my own past, my mom being kind of a traditional homemaker. And so she did those things. And so I'm asking out of that assumption that the primary responsibility for laundry lands on you, Gloria, right? Can I help you with that? But what we've discovered, at least in our relationship, is maybe a better way of saying that is, can I team well with you? And how can I do that, right? Rather than saying help, I'm using the language of team. And it creates opportunity for us then to say, hey, everything's on the table. And we really are trying to co-create our own culture within our marriage. Um, so you're surfacing the things that you know, you've already kind of assumed or maybe taken on over time. And then you're, you're trying to say, hey, let's, let's not necessarily go that route um, if it's not helpful. Let's have a generative conversation about, you know, does this work for us? Why? And then let's decide together. Does that make sense? All right. Well, I'm going to toss it over to Eric and Deborah. All right. Hand clap for John and Gloria. Thank you so much. A little free therapy. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, so the last step we wanted to talk about is making faith a priority in your marriage. And as we mentioned at the beginning, we realize you know, we're in different phases. Some of us are part of a Gateway, a church in Austin. Some of you may just be visiting, and we're so glad that you're here uh, with us. But, but uh, I'll just give you a quick little analogy, and then and Deborah has some thoughts to share, and uh, she won't let me see what they are, uh, speaking of good communication. But I do think that um, what I've discovered in our relationship is if we're both moving towards God, we're actually moving closer to each other. And you heard kind of throughout our time together, just this idea of forgiveness and empathy and really a lot of the traits that we see demonstrated in the life of Jesus. So Deborah, why don't you share a little bit? Uh, we've been married, uh, by the way, 26 years and... I have two kids, a 21-year-old and 18-year-old, and have also gone through some amazing seasons and some really challenging seasons, and also highly recommend you know, counseling and never giving up, uh, as on the other side of our worst season has been our best. Yeah. Um, yes. I just jotted down a few ideas so I may look from time to time at my paper but um, marriage when you uh, connect with someone in such a personal and intimate and vulnerable and transparent way um, it really uh, impacts every fiber of your being you know it impacts your psychology your relationships even outside your marriage your extended family unit, this, what we're talking about tonight, marriage is huge. And if we're at all interested in our spirituality and our walk with God uh, through Jesus, um, it's central to this conversation of, of marriage. Um, and yes, none of us are alone as we go through difficult times in marriage. Uh, sometimes marriage is awesome and you just, feel so lucky and how could life be so great? And then it might be followed by a different season where life feels overwhelming and your spouse is just not playing along and uh, can be very, very frustrating. Um, but I, I really like to think of marriage in terms of this is, the Bible says it's symbolic of Christ and the church. And uh, Jesus laid down his life for us. He's um, incredibly sacrificial. Uh, 
even though we're so undeserving, we never have to worry, is he going to abandon me? Am I too much for him? Um, and that's, is he listening or will he help me? Um, we know that he will always be faithful and good and understanding. And, and that is really what we're shooting for in marriage, um, that type of relationship. And none of us uh, deserve it. Um, we don't deserve that love from God. And we also don't deserve that love from our spouse, even though we may be really awesome. Um, we also fail them too. And so for me, um, when I feel incredibly frustrated um, or disappointed, I try to remember all that I've been forgiven for because it's a lot. And when I realize what I've been forgiven for, I can't hold on to, to um, unforgiveness and bitterness for very long. Um, and also, when I am feeling bitter and unforgiving, I usually just try to talk to God about it and to tell him just to be honest about how angry I feel and how I'm betrayed or whatever I'm feeling. And that in and of itself, um, a, for me, it opens a portal into God's presence where I feel his compassion and his sympathy and uh, even his understanding. Um, and so, um, so I think in our marriage, you know, we, we want to know that we're not going to be abandoned and we're not going to abandon. And um, this year has been a very difficult year for many of our friends and even families that, that have gone through a divorce and, and it has impacted us. It's impact. We've had so many conversations and not in a theoretical sense um, or in a textbook sense, but in a very heartfelt, broken hearted, um, it, divorce is so um, painful for not just the couple, but for all involved and even for the kingdom of God. Um, and so it's really laid on my heart that when we get married, we chose our spouse. You know, we don't, we don't get to choose our children, um, even though we love them so much and they're awesome most of the time, uh, we don't choose them. And we would never consider abandoning them um, not typically, um, uh, but so why would we do that for our spouse? We've become family and we've chosen them. And I feel like it's so important that we feel that, um, that foundation in our marriage. Otherwise, how can you be truly honest? How can you be truly transparent or even intimate if, um, you're fearing abandonment? Um, the very best thing that Eric does, and this is kind of a new thing, uh, because typically in our marriage, if one person gets triggered, then the other person out triggers them. And then before long, we're just having a trigger party and the kids are involved too. And it's crazy. Um, and we lived some years like that for sure. Um, but now, Eric has thrown some curveballs um, in the recent past, and it's my favorite curveball he's thrown me yet. Um, when I am really having a hard day and feeling beside myself with um, emotion or even frustrated with myself, and, and I direct my anger perhaps towards him, and I know that I'm misdirecting my anger. I'm very aware that I'm just unleashing my horrible day on him. And what he does is he will be loving and kind in response. And that, I don't know how to deal with. And maybe at first I push him away. Oh yeah, well, that's not what you said earlier. Oh yeah, well, last time you didn't do that and and then after i keep pushing i am thinking oh he's gonna get angry and he doesn't my heart starts to melt because i realize how undeserving i am of his kindness and and it really and usually instead of feeling angry i just end up crying like 
oh, I love you so much. I can't believe you're treating me so kindly. I so don't deserve it. And you would think that the way to tell the other person how stupid they are is to just come right out and say it. You're so stupid. How can you make that mistake again and again? Haven't I told you a million times? But that's not what works. What works is that love. All of a sudden, you know that you're being stupid and nobody has to convince you that you are overreacting and that you are a big part of the problem. And so for me, I didn't see that coming. That was just a fantastic um, uh, switcheroo. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's it. Well, let me just throw this out. As she said, this is a new curveball. <laughs> uh, we've, we've had trigger parties for far longer than we've had. Uh, really, it's this idea of absorbing uh, the anxiety uh, of others and breathing out peace. And if you can outlast the trigger without getting triggered, typically uh, it helps when, when someone is just willing to listen and willing to hug, it helps figure out why am I so bothered by this? Uh, I'm gonna talk about more of this on Sunday uh, at gatewaychurch.com, uh, 9, 15, 11, 15, and 6 p.m. on Central Standard Time. That series uh, we're doing called Self-Aware, a series we did last year called Trigger, was also incredibly helpful. And I'm going to send these links to you along with the notes from today in, the, in our time together uh, in an email, along with some of these classes and, and ways that you can follow up. I did want to create the space for some uh, Q&A. Uh, one last little thing that I wanted to mention is uh, one the, the crisis in our marriage was uh, built around unexpressed expectation. So learning to have good communication so that you can resolve the conflict leads to more intimacy. If you want to take the steps backwards, uh, but what's interesting is you can do them in any order because they all start to interconnect. If you can um, let the sun go down, uh, make sure you resolve your conflict, you're communicating better, you're more likely to pursue each other. One little last statistic. A couple that prays together out loud every day, the chances of them getting a divorce is one in 10,000. So just praying out loud, not over the kids, not over your meal, but like praying a blessing over your spouse, not like, God, please forgive my spouse for overreacting today, but more of a praying God's blessing on your spouse uh, and, and allowing her to pray that blessing over you. It's amazing how that will dissolve some of the bitterness It'll open up communication and lead to more intimacy. And so let me just uh, say, if you want to, in the chat, uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for your uh, message. Uh, if In the chat, if you don't mind, just send up a question. Can we give a little hand clap to my wife? Uh, thank you for sharing, Deb. Thank you. A little hand clap. I'll put a hand clap on there myself. All right, any questions? I saw one earlier from Rachel. Uh, by the way, you should know that people are more stressed out and so more easily triggered in the midst of the coronavirus. Uh, but Rachel had a good question. What are some dating ideas that have worked for you during the coronavirus? If you're, especially if you're in more of a quarantine. Anyone, uh, if you want to post uh, some thoughts there in the chat, we can start with that. Um, for us, uh, what we've been doing is we try to take Fridays and we tend to watch kind of that's our one time to binge watch <laughs> we're not eating out we're on quarantine pretty hard and so just telling the kids they're responsible for their own meals and we get three hours uh, in the living room without any interruption it feels like a date compared to the rest of our time uh, together other times we've just gotten in the car and driven just to be together uh, we're on a pretty significant lockdown here. So uh, those, of, those of you who have other ideas, uh, I can see there's some that are, there's a intimacy deck, uh, Carolyn posted, sitting outside together, thank you, John. Uh, dancing together, listening to music, game night. These are all really, really good. Uh, what are some other questions you might have, either in the chat or uh, just unmute yourself and ask and uh, let us know. Drive-in movies, the sunset, we have some good ones here. It's good. Taylor and Buda. Yeah, there's a, a great drive-in movie theater owned by some gatewayers. 
Uh, so yeah, the one in Buda owned by some gateway friends. So be sure you go there. Cooking competition sounds delicious. Excellent. Any other questions you guys might have for any one of us? Yeah. Uh, agreement about kids and education. I mean, what I loved about uh, what you heard, you know, talked about tonight is if you can improve communication, then you can resolve any conflict. And so what I would say is life is, you know, with a spouse is all about negotiating and making sure that the other is absolutely okay. You know, you want to come up with a, an agreement, an arrangement, and sometimes it might mean, you know, one of you sacrifices more than the other uh, for the sake of peace, but also for the sake of, you know, I love that question, you know, Gloria and John asked, will this really matter a year from now? You know, are you, are you, is it more important to be right or to make things right? And so, uh, yeah, that's a very good question, Mauricio. Thanks for asking. And I do think that getting a third party involved, having that other couple uh kind of mentors pick if you're not connected to a life group or community group being in part of one of these and and just latching onto a couple that may be a few years ahead of you could also be very helpful uh let's see uh, coco ask and i'll let uh uh john and gloria if you guys don't mind taking this one what do you do when you start getting irritated frequently with each other in a confined space during covid <laughs> Um, getting, they have some alone time. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it's just basically giving each other also some space. Like even if your apartment is really tiny, is it like putting in headphones and just watching your own like movie or, um, yeah, I think, I mean, we are both so busy that we're like shit's passing in the night, I think. So. We've been pretty busy. Yeah. I mean, we have a little one and we both work full time jobs. So you can imagine prior to my parents moving to Austin, which was like literally about two and a half weeks ago, um, we were just doing our best to kind of keep things. I don't know. I don't even know what to call it. I mean, it was just trying to make sure that we were surviving, you know, um, did we get irritated at one another? Sure, for sure, yeah. Um, but I think what helps us is we really do, like, it's a, it's a combination of what we said earlier, will this matter in a year, right? And I think also keeping things really cheap. Um, so if we're irritated and we do need to talk about it, then we make the space to actually talk about it and we try not to, like, allow things to fester and build up. Um, the last thing that I would say is just exercise gratitude for one another. You'll be amazed at how much that makes a difference when you just start thanking each other and appreciating each other. Um, that oftentimes drives down the irritability, especially if it's been in high doses recently. It's good. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Well, for me, I feel like even though it's really hot outside, I have been trying to walk every single day. I, if I wake up early, it's really a lot better, but I've been even, one time I walked recently for an hour around noon and it was very hot, but you know what? I felt so good. And um, this whole COVID season has been pretty stressful for multiple reasons. And I find that if I walk, I just feel so much more centered, connected to God, and I feel like it just gets my body um, just stronger and, and releasing a lot of stress. And it, it helps me. You know, I, I want to mention, too, going back to Mauricio's question, even um, if you're on different pages when it comes to how do we respond in the midst of the coronavirus, um, you know, or what do we do with the kids? One thing that we made a, a commitment to each other, so to speak, of. I told Deborah that we wouldn't do anything that we didn't feel was uh, led by God to do uh, and that it would be safe. And sometimes God leads you to do things that might seem unsafe, right? And so this idea of we kind of had two, you know, these two parameters. So we were going to pray about it and we were going to come to some sort of agreement about it. And it's been really helpful 
And I think it's really important that you have some parameters. You know, if it's about going to school, if it's about setting up uh, time to be alone, you know, it's almost like uh, if you are getting tired of each other, encourage, you know, maybe, maybe for you, a couple's group is the last thing you want to do. Uh, maybe you should be in a women's group and he could be in a, a men's group, you know, uh, to have some t separate time uh, from each other. If you work together, like you literally have a, a company together and you're living together and you're raising, like being in separate uh, friend groups, having your own kind of small, small group, community group, serving in different areas can be very actually healthy. Uh, yeah, thank you for that, Preeti and Albert. Um, professional counseling was a game changer, life marriage saver for us um, when, when we were going through a difficult time. And we have lots of great counselors we can refer to you. Uh, any of us as pastors can certainly help. But we'll, we'll tell you, we're not professional counselors, but we can help you find one that is. And we certainly can give you, you know, some help along the way. Any other last questions before we wrap up? Hey, well, thank you guys so much for coming tonight. I'll send you an email with some resources, hopefully in the next 24 hours or so. It's great to see so many faces we know. Look forward to meeting those of you that we haven't met yet. And again, join us Sunday and take a look at that email for more resources. Thank you guys. God bless.